Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Be anxious for nothing but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall defend your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. For the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. So let's have a few moments of silent prayer so we can make sure that we are spiritually prepared to study the word. Then I will open in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful that we can be here this evening. We're thankful for the way you work in our lives, for the way the Holy Spirit uh, brings to our memory the principles of your word and the scriptures and that throughout the day we have opportunities to apply your word that we may uh, grow as God the Holy Spirit works in our lives. Father, we pray for those who aren't here this evening who are fighting uh, various illnesses. We pray for them and their recovery, and that during the time of illness that they may, uh, it may be a time for them to focus on you a little bit, and that they may be a good testimony to your grace. Father, we pray as we study your word this evening that we may be able to focus and Think, and that God the Holy Spirit would use this to edify us and strengthen us in our relationship with you and in the way we serve you in our life. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. We are in Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. And the theme in Romans is justification and righteousness. Both come out of the same word group. Uh, Dikaiao is the Greek verb. Dikaios is the noun for righteousness. The theme of Romans is the righteousness of God. And this is really a a question, people don't frame it this way, but this is really the question that people ask is when they when they look at something like the uh, tsunami that occurred, the earthquake and tsunami that occurred in Japan, they look at other natural disasters, or they look at other horrors, they look at what happens in war, they look at what happens in, in the Holocaust, they ask the question, how can God really be, be righteous? And yet we have to go back to what Abraham said, and that is, how shall the judge of all the earth not do right? How shall the judge of all the earth not do right? We can't approach God and approach the events of our lives by thinking first and foremost in terms of a limited frame of reference. We can't look at it and think that somehow we know enough information, we know enough of the facts, we control enough of all the possibilities that could be occurring in history, uh, and so we can make a judgment that God is, is right or God is wrong. How can God be just if he allows these things to happen? And so within uh, Paul's structure of his discourse in Romans, he's stating the righteousness of God and how the righteousness of God relates to human history, to human beings uh, individually as well as to uh, human history as a whole, which you'll cover under the concepts of of what we usually translate as the world, whether it's cosmos or ionos, and it has to do with the time frame where fallen man is in control of, of history. And so we see that, that the breakthrough in, in history is God in terms of his grace from the time that Adam first sinned and God came to uh, the Garden of Eden to... Uh, confront Adam and Eve with the fact that they had sinned, and what was their initial reaction? They ran and hid. This sets up a pattern. It's not just that, oh, that's just what they did. I wouldn't have done that. No, if it had been you or I, uh, we would have done the same thing. If God had come, uh, we would have run and hid because we had disobeyed him, and because something happens, the Scripture says, to every human being because of sin. It happened to Adam because he was created without sin, and he was 
perfectly righteous because he was created in the image of God. And being created in the image of God, there was something in the immaterial makeup of man that had correspondence to similar attributes in the makeup of God so that man could reflect God in a, a way that's unique and distinct from all other creatures. But when Adam sinned, and then God came to walk in the garden that afternoon with Adam and Eve, as he had done on a day-by-day basis, their reaction was to run and hide because something happened to them when they sinned. There is a constitutional impact of sin. Theologians call it total depravity. Sometimes that word is not always used or properly understood. And sometimes, especially in the case of, of Reformed theology or, or Calvinism, the phrase that is used is total inability. That is a major issue that comes out of our study of this passage because within the Reformed camp, the idea is that man, because of sin, is so constitutionally affected that he cannot Uh, do anything towards God. He can't even express uh, positive volition uh, toward God. And so because of that, man's, in their view, man is, is dead, and they view dead as being something that is completely inoperable rather than being separated from God. We can look at some of those issues as we go through this particular passage. But I've always loved the study of this section from verse 18 down through the end of the chapter, because there's so much here, not just in terms of the structure of Paul's thought, which is a brilliant exposition of not just New Testament, this isn't New Testament revelation. I mean, it is in terms of this is what Paul is writing, and it's part of the New Testament. But Paul is basing this on what has been revealed in the Old Testament. And, and so he's applying this in a a uh, different way in demonstrating the need of, that man has for righteousness, not just all human beings, but also Jews. And in this particular uh, section, some, some, um, there's some debate and discussion about whether uh, Paul is talking about uh, Jews and Gentiles or just Gentiles. And we have the statement that's made in verse 18 that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. And that's not a sexist term. That's the Greek word uh, anthropos in the genitive, plural genitive form. And anthropos is roughly, sometimes it does refer to the male versus the female, but generally it refers to the human race, to mankind. Now, due to radical feminism in the last 40 years, that's politically incorrect and unacceptable talk. You have to always use these gen gender nonspecific uh, pronouns, but God didn't think you ought to do that, so I don't think that's called for. Uh, it's mankind, because the first person created was a man, and everyone descended from a man, and that first man's name is Adam, and Adam is also a word in Hebrew that means mankind. It's not only the proper name for Adam, but it also refers to uh, all of the human race or all of mankind. So this is a reference to what happens within the human race. And the discipline of God, the judgment of God in time that is um, revealed, that is disclosed, that is poured out against a uh, man who is all under condemnation. Condemnation is the outworking of God's character. His righteousness establishes the standard of his character and his justice is the application of that standard to his creatures. Now, if you keep that in mind, and always think about righteousness as being the absolute standard, and then in judgment, God has to apply that standard to his creatures, then we can understand why God acts in, uh, in reference to the human race the way he does, why God allows things to happen the way he does. And if you want to understand... Uh, what happens in this chapter that begins in verse 18, that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. That's that's sort of your topical statement of how God's wrath, which is his judgment in time, 
And judgment in history, it's not, as I pointed out last time, it's not just a future judgment that will occur ultimately in the tribulation period and in those judgments, but the word wrath is often used to describe the uh, judgment of God, the outpouring discipline of God on mankind during, uh, during this life, during this age. And so this is the topical state, uh, sentence. We're told why he does this. In verses 19 and 20, we get further explanation. You see the word because in verse 19, the word for at the beginning of 20, and the word uh, because in uh, 21. All of these terms give us an understanding of the structure of the thought of God as we move through this particular uh, particular passage. And then when we come to the end of uh, the explanation in 121, uh, which uh, begins with, uh, it's translated in the New American Standard uh, for, but it's not that, usually we expect a Greek word gar at the, when it's translated for, Gar is a word that means it's it's building a case and it's adding additional information or explanation for what has just been said. This is a different Greek word, and it's a Greek word dihadi, which means uh, because, and it's emphasizing that um, that and it's and it's in conjunction with the participle, which is uh, which sort of reduplicates that. So there's a strong causal sense at the beginning of uh, of verse twenty one that because although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks. That's the indictment against mankind. They don't honor Him as God. There's a rejection of divine authority. That's at the very core of what happened in Genesis 3 in, with, with the sin of Eve and then the sin of Adam is a rejection of God's authority. And in essence, they're, they're thinking you can't separate the thought uh, from the act of the disobedience, because God said, don't eat from the fruit. He didn't say, don't think about it. Uh, so there's no mental attitude sin or sins of the tongue or anything else that they could have committed. The only sin they could commit was the act of eating the fruit. But the thought and the act went together uh, inseparably in that event. And when that happened, it is they're, they're showing complete disrespect and rebellion for uh, the authority of God. He doesn't know what he's talking about in essence. So the issue that we see here uh, throughout this passage is an issue related to knowledge. Knowledge. Even though they knew God, uh, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations. And that word for speculations in the Greek is another word for for knowledge, a, a word that's related to uh, knowing something or, or learning something. So all through this, you have words that, that are related to knowledge. You have a whole range of words. It's not that it would be translated knowledge, but there's a series of words here that are used that all have something to do with the acquisition of information and acting on it. So you have words like uh, to know God, uh, they became futile in their speculations, in their understanding is the um, is the Greek word uh, that is uh, tr- translated there. They become futile in their, um, actually the word there for speculations is the uh, Greek word dialogismos, which has to do with their thought processes. They become uh, empty in their thought processes. So that that is wiped out as a result of their spiritual decision. Now, that's really interesting. And what we're seeing here, what I'm going to spend time just trying to, to think through for everybody and, and unpack, is, is are these ideas that come out of this passage in relation to understanding uh, who we are, what God is saying about human beings. So we become... Uh, our, our thought processes get completely uh, rewired and screwed up. Not the brain, that's the hardwire, but the thinking. Because we want to start at the wrong starting point. And because we start at the wrong starting point, we end up with the wrong conclusion. And then verse 22, professing to be wise, they became fools. Wise and fools are both words that relate to knowledge. And then they exchange the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man, and they go into idolatry. So you get a break then that occurs at verse 24, and we read God giving them over 
and the lust of their heart to impurity. So you, this deals with ethics in a broad sense and, and morality. So the morality is a result of something that took place uh, in their knowledge or in philosophical terms, in, in terms of their epistemology. Their epistemology gets messed up, and because their epistemology is messed up, their morality is messed up. Now we're going to move it back even further because the, the, what messes up their reasoning, their knowledge, and their thought machine in verse 21 is what? It is their rejection of God. That, verse 19, what is known of God is evident within them, and God made it evident to them. So they, it's not a question of do they know that God exists. It's not really a question of, at some level, an absolute conviction of that knowledge, which is epistemology, but they reject it. That's their volition. And what they're rejecting is, uh, is the existence of the God who has revealed himself to Adam and Noah and Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, and revealed himself through the Bible. So that is what <clears throat> philosophers call metaphysics, that which goes beyond the physical. Uh, ontology is a Latin word, means the same thing. People always get confused. Those are big 50-cent words. They're not nearly as big as the words every baby learns to speak in, in Russia, though. Just think about that. Every word in Russia is this long. and has five syllables plus endings. And if two-year-olds can say those words, you can figure out words like ontology and metaphysics. Those are not that difficult. Um, but in the, the reason I'm going that way is because in the structure of as man seeks to understand reality apart from Scripture, and he seeks to have knowledge and wisdom, that comes under the category of philosophy. And philosophy seeks to answer the same questions that religion seeks to answer, except it seeks to do it apart from any external source or claim of any external source of revelation. So the questions are, is there an ultimate reality? Is there something beyond the physical? Is there a god or gods or something like that? That's metaphysics. And metaphysics dictates what, what you do with that question dictates what you do with the next question, which is knowledge and certainty of knowledge. And can you know anything? And that then determines your, your conscience, your sense of right and wrong, your morals, your ethics, and all of that. And that then works itself out in terms of how you structure society. So if you, don't have the, if you reject the Word of God and the absolutes of the Word of God, that changes your understanding of absolute reality, which dominoes down. It changes your thought systems and, and it changes your, uh, then it changes your, your views of knowledge uh, and, and uh, reasoning, and then that changes your sense of morals and absolutes and right and wrong, and everything dominoes. So if you take God out of the equation, then you can't have a right view of knowledge, and you can't have a right ethic. You've got to, if you've got, to the degree your metaphysic is messed up, your epistemology and your ethics are messed up. And, that's, and ethics is where you get law, politics, government, uh, marriage, family. All of those things come under that category. So it, it just shows this, this domino effect. So it's very important. People say, oh, this is straining my brain. And uh, I, never, I never don't know anything like this. That's because you had government-sponsored education. Um, but this is important to understand these things because this is how you build the ability to think critically about what's going on when you, if you open up the newspaper or you turn on the radio or the uh, television and listen to what's going on and all the things that are happening today in the political sphere. Isn't it interesting that what's happening just in the last week I mean, you, you, it's a, you, you we're seeing, I think, a realignment in the political sphere in terms of key leaders. In about, a, when was it, a month ago when things started to act up in, in, in uh, Libya? And you had the rebels coming out of, out, of, uh, <clears throat> out of the woodwork, and they want to throw off Gaddafi, and then Gadda, uh, uh, Gaddafi is coming down, he's going to... Uh, uh, he starts to suppress them. And then you start hearing people say, oh, we have, to, we have to intervene and help the rebels. Haven't heard the question, who are the rebels? 
What do they believe in? What are they going to do if they replace Gaddafi? I mean, the devil we know, we don't know, can, can indeed be worse than the devil we know. Um, oh, but he's doing evil things to them. I mean, bad people have done bad things to bad people all throughout history. That isn't a justification for for necessarily inter- intervening, especially at the cost of the lives of of uh, young men and young women from Kansas, Nebraska, Texas, and wherever. So. But you had you, who? Who were some of the people who were initially out there saying we need to intervene now and overthrow Gaddafi? They were conservatives. You had Newt Gingrich and Sarah Palin and John McCain. And I'm sitting back here going, oh, wait a minute, this 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 isn't pass a smell test for me. Then the next thing you heard was the was on the extreme liberal left because their knee jerk reaction to any. Uh, uh, any kind of event of, of perceived oppression is to send American soldiers in to protect the oppressed, whoever they might might be. Of course, that mentality is heavily influenced by Marxist socialist ideas, and so you had that on the extreme uh, on the extreme left. That sort of knee jerk reaction to just immediately get involved. And then what happened? Then all of a sudden, then within the Democrat Party, you you see a split. The president's not doing anything. And he's sort of waiting for somebody else to to lead. And then Secretary of State Clinton and Susan Rice and a couple of others start putting some pressure. They want to intervene. And so the interventionists somehow got the upper hand, influenced things in the U.N. The U.N. passed a resolution, and that gave the president the whatever he needed to intervene. I've been watching this with a lot of interest in the last week because what you're seeing is a breakdown of thought on on both sides. You you get people operating on different thought systems, but neither one of them are grounded in really very well in reality. And so they're really kind of going against each other. You just kind of watch it. So I've been watching some on MSNBC and you see some liberals for it, some against it, some conservatives for it, some against it. And yesterday I read Tom, uh, editorial by Thomas Friedman. Tom, I don't always agree with Thomas Friedman. I mostly don't. But every now and then he, he does have a good knowledge of the Middle East. His interpretation of things isn't always great. But he didn't say anything I disagreed with yesterday. I had to go back and reread it just because I thought, well, maybe I had had a stroke or something. And so, and missed missed it, but he came out very strongly that we shouldn't be be in Libya because this is really tribal. It's not a it's not a not a revolution. It's just a civil war. It's a tribal thing, and and we shouldn't be there at all. It's not worth worth it. And I thought, here's a guy who's probably a Clinton supporter, and he's been real a real strong Obama supporter, and now he's he's taken a position that goes against both of them. Is the left eating? their own. Is this the beginning of a fragmentation on the left? It's really interesting because what lies behind this are all these kind of ideas that I'm talking about because once you start taking absolute truth out of the equation so you don't have an ultimate reference point for decision making, then what happens is you you basically make important decisions on on sort of gut things. Well, we have to intervene in that war because those people are being oppressed. Well, what about these other people over here? They're being just as oppressed. If that's our standard, why don't we go in over there? Well, no, we're not going to intervene there because they're not our favorites. There's no external absolute to control the thought process, and it's happening on the right and on the left just as much because... At, at upper echelons of, of the influence of the, of the powerful in this country, they, they can't think objectively in, in the terms of absolute truth as we have handed down in Scripture. So this is, it's, we can sort of sit back and watch this with a measure of objectivity if you pay attention to what's happening. Because there, there's no clear criterion for for intervention, except one that every now and then you hear, and that is, how does this affect Israel? We're supposed to support Israel, so uh, for some reason that, that the residual impact of evangelical 
uh, belief in this country going back to the Puritans in the 17th century, who came, the Puritans who came over to this country, as well as many Puritans in England, had a firm belief that eventually the, the uh, Jews should be restored to their homeland because that's what the Bible taught. And it's only in America that you've had this, this base of, of what's called philo-Semitism. It's the opposite of anti-Semitism. Only in America have you had that. You don't have, why, why is, is Europe a, 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 a group of nations that their knee-jerk response is always to believe the Palestinians over against the Israelis? They never believe they take the Israeli side. Why? because of centuries of Christian anti-Semitism and then secular anti-Semitism from the 19th century to the present because of uh, the influence of replacement theology within Roman Catholic Catholic teaching. What does all this go back to? It goes back to their perception of God and what God is doing on the earth. You can't get away from that no matter what you do. You can't get away from, from people are either suppressing the truth and unrighteousness or they're trying to learn the truth and conform to righteousness. But there's no middle ground. It's either one, one or the other. And so that's what uh, Paul is developing here in his foundational uh, statement in Romans 1, 18 uh, to 23. This paragraph has so much, not just in terms of its, of its immediate content and the interpretation of these verses, but in terms of its implications for who man is, who God is, why man has the problems we have, and understanding why bad things happen to good people, why you have bad things such as uh, natural disasters like tsunamis and earthquakes and hurricanes, why these things are allowed to take place. And it goes back to this concept of divine discipline from God, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. It is the ungodliness and unrighteousness of man that is the moral cause of all of this. It was all caused by, uh, based on Genesis 3, it's all caused by, uh, by a moral, ethical problem, or what we would call a spiritual problem, the rejection of God. It wasn't because they had bad technology, it wasn't because they were using... Uh, um, carbon, ba- you know, they had carbon-based emissions, or they were uh, using aerosol cans and screwing up the environment. No, they made a moral decision against God, and it really messed up the environment in ways they could they could never never imagine. And then uh, God begins to explain that uh, as we go forward. What's interesting is when you get down when we get down into verse twenty four and following, we have these statements that are made in verse twenty four. Therefore. Because of their rejection of God and consequent idolatry, therefore God also gave them up to, and then you have several things will be listed. Then verse 26, for this reason, you get the next level of intensification. God gave them up to vile passions. And then in verse 28, uh, that goes to the third level. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind, so you have the third level. What is God doing? This chapter explains the problems, all the problems in history, whether they're social or whether they're physical. And that is, as man rejects God, God gives them enough rope to hang themselves. That's basically what this is saying. You want to rebel against me? Okay, I'm just going to, you know, I'm just going to let the leash loose a little bit more and give you a little more room to destroy yourself and to show that the re- when you reject me, it is the most self-destructive thing you can do. And what it does in turn is it just confirms them in their rebelliousness and then it goes to the next level. And so what we, see, what we will see when we get into 24 through 32 and we look at all of these uh, various things that are described that are the result of God just basically taking his hands off the controls a little bit more, and then he takes them off a little bit more and takes them off a little bit more. Each time he takes them off, there's more sinful activity. So you have that in the first stage, there's idolatry, an increase in idolatry. In the second stage, there is the increase of homosexuality. That's the judgment, folks. 
we're not going to be judged for homosexuality. Homosexuality is the judgment for negative volition. And so people, I often hear Christians say, we need to pray that God won't judge us. Or, or that uh, you know, sometimes you'll hear people say, well, if God's going to be fair to Sodom and Gomorrah, he would, he would do something to San Francisco. Well, San Francisco and Sodom and Gomorrah are the judgment. Now, just think about that a little bit. When you have your morning devotions tomorrow, you can think that through a little bit. But that's, that's what Paul is explaining here, is that the, and then when you get down into the third stage, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They're whispers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. That describes modern culture. All those adjectives. But I, I hate to tell you this, but the United, as, as much as we may think the United States has slipped, and we have, the rest of the world has slipped a lot further and a lot faster. And the more I talk to people who travel internationally, the level, we may look around what's going on here, and some of you may not like what you see at all, and, but what's going on here is not as bad as what's going on everywhere else. It's just that they're further down the road. The level of corruption that I see in places like the former Soviet Union, all those different countries, the level of corruption in African nations, the level of corruption that you have in Latin America, which we're importing by the hundreds of thousands and millions every year as all of these illegal aliens and legal immigrants come up bringing their culture of graft with them from the South, it's impacting us. I've talked to people who are from Corpus Christi and who have knowledge of what's going on in the Corpus Christi city government and San Antonio and places south. And the further south you go where there's more of an impact of, of the Hispanic culture in city, local, county government, the more you get, you know, you hire... You hire one member of the family, the next thing you know, all the other members of the family have been hired, and the, the culture of government control begins to change, and you get this, you, you just increase this whole uh, dependency mentality that the government is just supposed to take care of us. And this is just going to get worse and worse and worse in graft and, and bribes. Uh, I was... Um, Conversation the other day, one of the men on the board for Chafer, I mean for um, Dean Bible Ministries, was here from Arkansas. He is a uh, vice president with Walmart, and he was talking. We were talking about this whole topic, and he was telling me about a situation that occurred a couple of years ago. As Walmart spent about three or four years trying to uh, break into the Russian market, finally they just washed their hands of the whole thing and left. But the president of Walmart flew over there on a Walmart jet. And while it was there, it needed some maintenance, it needed a part, it wasn't safe to fly it out, so they needed to get it repaired. Well, the Russians weren't going to let them repair it unless they, they paid the bribe. And he had, the, the president of Walmart had the moral courage to refuse to pay. And he said, okay, I'm just going to leave it here, and um, I'll get a ticket on an airplane and fly home. And we'll just leave it here. And it took about six months before... Uh, the Russian authorities finally let them fly a part in and get it fixed and fly the fly their jet out. But he was not going to cave in to the graft. And when I was in Ukraine this year and I was talking to leaders in the Jewish community that are there um, with, uh, I was there with the Joint Distribution Committee leader and the um, uh, <clears throat> uh, Jaffe leader. And they were talk, both talking about how they don't, know how anybody gets anything done in Ukraine because the level of corruption is so deep, so set in the culture. Generations, it's, it's, it's temporal in terms of it's spread across several generations, deep within Russian mindset, but it also goes deep, vertically deep into the mindset of the culture. You can't turn that around unless there's just some sort of massive movement of God and we're not there. The United States is a long way from there, so we can thank God we're not there. So it always, sometimes we get our eyes on where, where we, should have, we were 30, 40 years ago, 
and we're disappointed and we don't like where we're going. But take a look at where everybody else is and thank God you're still in America. And thank God we still have the blessing of God and we still have the freedom to teach the Word, the word of God and teach the Bible here. So this is what happens when people are negative to God. God begins to remove the cultural restraints and you're, you see the increase in immorality, the increase in violence, the increase, uh, you, you see role reversal takes place. Go back and listen to, to what I taught in the Judges series. You see a role reversal that takes place where the, the, the men become feminine, feminized and the women become masculinized. And this is what's happening in our culture. And what always happens when you get those role reversals in, culture, in, in the culture is you start, women be, become treated less and less like people and they be, they, the physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse of women increases because of the dominance of pagan thought. So the irony is be, when you're living in the, the devil's world and you're operating on human viewpoint instead of divine viewpoint, as the feminist movement seeks uh, equality for women, uh, what they've done is they've produced gener- a couple of generations now of increasingly feminized males, and what's happened a- as a correlation to the uh, promotion of their feminist uh, goals is that it's led to greater and greater uh, abuse of women, uh, sexual abuse, uh, emotional abuse, and in other areas. So uh, we have to learn to think biblically or we're going to just be swept along with the tide that goes, goes with our culture. So let's stop, and first thing I want to do is kind of go through these, the, uh, two or three of these verses to see what their structure is, and then talk about the implications and application. Uh, we've already covered pretty much 18 and 19. The wrath of God is d- discipline on man during human history, is revealed, disclosed from heaven against all ungodliness, and unrighteousness of men. It's their rejection of God who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So I'm going to come back and talk about this. The truth has an article with it in the Greek, and it shows that, that even in this discussion, there's something embedded here. There's something that is presupposed and assumed by the biblical writers under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and that is that there is an absolute truth that controls and governs all thought. And that that absolute truth, which ultimately comes from an understanding of God, is being suppressed in un- by means of unrighteousness. It's, it's this idea of suppression. A couple, a couple of illustrations. I remember when I was a kid, and you, you're, you're, you're outside, and you're trying to you see if you can close your eyes tight enough and put your hands over your eyes to see if you can shut out all the light and just have total darkness. And you can't really do it. Ultimately, light comes in. And that's what happens in in this illustration is that God is always present. There is something that resonates in the soul of every human being because they're created in the image of God that no matter how sophisticated their arguments may be, no matter how intelligent and intellectual they can be, God's reality is always popping up in very, at very, very inconvenient times. That's the real inconvenient truth. Just seeing who's aware of anything in the culture right now. You remember Al Gore's movie, An Inconvenient Truth on Global Warming. That's the, the real inconvenient truth is that God exists and that God's in control. So we try to suppress the truth. It's like filling your bathtub up with water and putting a couple of dozen corks in there and then trying to hold them all under the water at the same time. They're just going to start popping up here and there, and you're going to start grabbing, and as soon as you do, some others are going to pop up. You just can't can't do it. So that's the imagery here, and it's it's, uh, also this word for suppression brings up an idea that uh, I think in some sense, because a, a stopped watch is right twice a day, uh, Freud had something when he said part of the problem that man has is repression. Yes, but he had the wrong thing being repressed or suppressed. It's the knowledge of God that is being suppressed or repressed, not uh, any other thing. 
And then Paul goes on to say in verse, verse 19, because using this, this word dihati again, very strong word for causal relationship, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. And there we, it's very important to understand God built it into the makeup of every human being. There's nobody you can talk to that doesn't have something. Long before he ever saw the stars in the sky or he examined the, the details of a, of, a, of, a, of a cell, long before any of the uh, intelligent design arguments came along or he could understand the cosmological argument for the existence of God, long before any of that, when that little baby is uh, one, two, three years old, sometime in there, there's something that is vibrating in his soul, and he knows God exists. So it's be prior to, that is what is referred to as, uh, the Latin term is a priori knowledge, prior knowledge. Then once that child grows up and sees creation, Creation bears the stamp of God's ownership and creativity on everything. So that when you look at a tree, that tree says, God made me, non-verbally. The cow says, God made me. But what man says is, I'm not buying that. I don't want God to make you. I want, because if God made you, then I'm accountable for the decisions I make, and I'm accountable spiritually. So I've got to, I reject that. I've got to suppress it. So you have these two things. What may be known about God is manifest in them. That's that prior knowledge, that a priori knowledge. For God has shown it to them. That's external. That came after. So that's called a posteriori or po- posterior. That's after. You know, your posterior is your, your backside. So that's what's behind. So you have what's before and what's behind. And so that's important because I'll educate you a little bit later on on how that affects some of these arguments for God. The, the usual arguments people hear, uh, hear about, the cosmological argument, the anthropological argument, the moral argument for God, these are a posteriori arguments. There's only one a priori argument, and that's the ontological argument. And the ontological argument is one that always twists people's brains inside out. And that's the argument that because man can think of nothing more perfect than the existence of God, he must exist. Because if he didn't exist, then something more perfect that had existence would exist, and that would be God. We'll cover that later. And then Paul says, for since the creation of the wor- world, and I just love the, the uh, um, uh, irony here that he brings into the sense of creation of the world, his invisible attributes, which you can't see, are clearly seen. See the fun juxtaposition of words there, being understood by the things uh, that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. It's not written out for them, but they have so many pictures. If you can't read it, just look at the pictures. God says the pictures give enough information about him so that people are spiritually accountable for their relationship with God. This is what's called general revelation. And then we also have special revelation. So I want to define both of these terms. Very important to understand this. The failure to understand some of the things I'm going to bring out here is the reason a lot of Christians have become... Uh, have, have gotten out of bounds and they've become deceived in our in, in b- with modern thought. Modern thought is something that I, I, I was reading Francis Schaeffer the other day. Uh, I read first read Schaeffer years ago. I, I know a couple of people in the congregation have been reading him uh, at different times in the last couple of years. He his foundational works are a trilogy called Escape from Reason. Uh, he is there and he is not silent, and the God who is there. Actually, I think that they were supposed to, Schaefer thought they should be read, God who is there first, then uh, he is there and he is not silent, and then escape from reason, although I, I may be wrong. And he points out that what happened is, is up until about the early 1900s, he, he dates it to 1913. I would date it earlier. Uh, but he take, takes it to the 1930s. He said, everybody in the world, at least in Western society, thought the same. I would take it at least till about 1800. I think pe- things changed after 1800. 
and the change probably got, was completed by 1913, which was right before World War I. But if you, go, if you or I were taken back in time a hundred years, even as much as you've learned from the Word of God and I've learned from the Word of God, you would feel like you were, you, your thinking was out of step with everybody in this country. You don't realize the thought revolution that occurred in Western civilization in the late 19th century and into the early 20th century. It was radical. It was almost more than radical. People after World War II did not think about reality the way they thought about reality a hundred years earlier. And that was because of the influence of three things that are related. I think three philosophies that are related. There's something that lies behind them we'll talk about. But the three philosophies that came out of the, of the 19th century, mid-19th century, and their, their leaders, the, the, the men who thought these things and promoted them, Karl Marx, and uh, Karl Marx and Marxism on the one hand, then you had Charles Darwin and Darwinism on the other hand, and then you had the rise of sociology. And I would include psychology, Freud, within that move towards sociology. And you have men like Herbert Spencer, who's considered the father of modern sociology. And those three systems, Darwinistic evolution, Marxism, and sociology, all cross-pollinated. These men, Marx, Herbert Spencer, um, and... um, Freud, all uh, they and Darwin uh, corresponded with one another, and they really produced a kind of thinking that had been sort of below the surface for about fifty or seventy-five years prior to them. It really came out of the the thinking of Immanuel Kant, and that just gives you the his, historical background. But Francis Schaeffer, who was writing this, or actually he taught this in lectures. They were trans; those three books are transcripts. Schaefer said this in in the late 60s. He's sitting over there in his little uh, Christian uh, community over there in, uh, in in Switzerland, and he's seeing all these uh, tuned in, dropped out, draft dodging uh, uh, 60s baby boomers who've become totally despairing of life. They're on the edge of suicide because they have pushed the intellectual thought envelope of their generation to its natural conclusion and seeing that there's no hope, there's no joy, there's no despair. We're just, every one of us is just an accidental blob of protoplasm and there's no purpose or meaning or value in anything and I can't live like that. It was, it, it was existentialism at its extreme. And my belief has always been that existentialism gone to seed is what came to be known as postmodernism. And so Francis Schaeffer's right on the right at the beginning of what has become known as postmodernism and multiculturalism and political correctness and all these things all come out of the same nasty evil seed. And he saw all of this, and I, I was I've read, gone back and read different portions of some of these books in the last uh, couple of weeks. And I'm reading and I'm thinking, it hasn't changed one bit since, since this came out in 1969. It, there, it, this doesn't need to be updated. He's just right on target because he understood the thinking of the times and that, that the way Western civilization thought and perceived reality up until about 1900 was that there was still objective truth. But after 1900, I mean, intellectuals didn't believe that anymore before 1900. But by the, by the time of World War II, the average man on the street in America, whether he uh, said he believed in absolute truth or not, he had his soul and his thinking and his values so shaped by a culture that rejected absolute truth that he didn't realize how, uh, how the Trojan horse of situational ethics and moral relativism had already seeped into his thinking. He had absorbed it through his education. And he was thinking like an unbeliever, even if he was a believer. And, and, and the, 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 the split personality that you see among 
Christianity that led to the great fragmentation that's occurred in the last 30 years among, among conservative uh, uh, Christians in all kinds of theological positions all goes back to that. And the only hope is to, is to go back to God. But, you know, what we see historically is, is that that's usually not the trend. There have been a few changes in history, but that's usually not the trend. So we have to understand what goes on, and it always goes back to what was the basic problem that Adam and Eve had in the garden? It was an authority problem. What is the ultimate authority in your life? What is going to tell you what to do and how to think and how to live? Is it going to be God and his word, or is it going to be the culture or uh, your friends or what makes you feel most comfortable uh, some sort of sub- all of which can ultimately be traced to some sort of subjective impression. So you have two two books. This is how this has been understood: is you have one book that's a picture book, and that's general revelation. So the nonverbal disclosure from God uh, is contained in His works of creation and in His acts of providence in human history. It's nonverbal, so, but you learn from it. You learn from those pictures. And then special revelation is the direct verbal self-disclosure of God to his creatures. What's the difference between the two? One is verbal, one is nonverbal. The verbal has precision. The nonverbal can be misinterpreted at levels. But you see in the scripture that the writers of scripture go to general revelation in order to illustrate principles in special revelation. One example is in the Proverbs. You read in the Proverbs how uh, we are to observe the ant. Are we to just look indiscriminately at everything that goes on in an ant colony and say, oh, I'm going to look at this. There's one queen and a bunch of little worker. You know, and the queen dominates all the men. Well, let's make that our model for society. No, the Bible tells you what to use for an analogy and what not to use for an analogy. Look at, observe the ant and how he works. That's the end of it. You don't pattern anything else. So there's, there's these patterns that God built into, uh, into creation, but you have to have special revelation to interpret general revelation. And otherwise, you can misinterpret it. For, uh, one illustration of this that I'll, I'll use, no matter how much general revelation you, that Adam had, it was the special revelation of God saying, Thou shalt not eat from this tree. They told him which tree not to eat. All the general revelation, all the pictures, wouldn't have told him the specifics he needed. So, so these aren't equal books. And the reason I say that is since, since the 19th century, or actually it goes back even further, it goes back into about the 17th, 17th, 17th century, you had the, this, this issue of competing authority coming out of, the, out, of the, out of the Enlightenment. And in the Enlightenment, there was a shift back to studying creation and studying, uh, studying nature. And you see this in art because if you go back to the Byzantine period and the... And, uh, and the period before the Renaissance and the Enlightenment, uh, nature is sort of idealized. They're not painting trees as real trees, or squirrels as real squirrels, or people as real people. They're idealized. But after the Renaissance and into the into the Enlightenment, they're painting nature as it is, as they see, actually see it. Not like Picasso saw it later on, but as they saw it, you know, like like as close to a as photograph as as they could get it. Because they believe in in an ultimate in an ultimate reality, but they're emphasizing nature as nature, and they went too far, and they make the book of nature and natural and what they call they they use the term natural revelation instead of general revelation, and that nature can communicate truth that is of the same equal level and of, of and authority as special revelation. And so this little shift that occurred there, moving from general revelation to natural re- revelation, led to phrases like the one we have in the Declaration of Independence, nature and nature's God, because to, some deg- to a large degree Jefferson's influenced by this kind of language uh, in, in the late 1700s, uh, that, that you, you, take, you take creation 
as an equal source of authority to special revelation. By the time you get into the 19th century, this means that science has equal authority to the Bible, and what happens after that? Science becomes more authoritative than the Bible. The observations and interpretations of man then are used to judge the Bible. Another area in which this is really big is in the whole area of, of, of psychology versus the Bible. Because when you get into the arguments, and this was one of the things that used to, uh, uh, I really had to work a lot with when I was in seminary, you kept hearing this phrase, all truth is God's truth. Well, that sounds right, doesn't it? Sort of like Satan saying, well, you know, if you, God didn't say that if you look at it, you'll die. Um, all truth is God's truth. Well, in, in some sense, that's true. But what that means is that nature's truth is, has the same authority as the Word of God. And then you judge the Word of God by what you get from nature's truth, so that, so that the studies you get from, from psychology are used then to interpret the Word of God. The issues now from science are used to interpret the Word of God, so that you have... Today, just today, I was reading an article by somebody who was saying, you know those Christians who really believe in a young, young earth view? They just need to get out more. They need to read more. Uh, they need to study more. There's all kinds of other orthodox views of Genesis 1. And where does that come from? It comes from the fact that we're looking at our observations and giving them the same authority as Scripture. There are two books, but the picture book is interpreted by the word book. And the word book has authority over, over the picture book. Now, just as a correlation to what I just put up there with uh, Romans 1, is an Old Testament truth. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows His handiwork. You can look at creation, you can look at the universe and learn something about the manufacturer, the creator, by looking at what he created. And then verse 2 says, day unto day utters speech. There's communication there. Remember, this is poetry, so you, we always make a mistake of trying to make poetry uh, have the same kind of precision that legal language has, and it doesn't. It's poetry. Uh, so you have a lot more figures of speech. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. So the Bible's consistent. You can learn things from the picture book. You just you can also make more mistakes looking at the picture book, so you can't ultimately make the picture book your authority. And then verse 3, there's no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Universal. General revelation is universal to every human being on the planet. Every tribe, every nation, every language can understand the picture book. But see, as Paul says in Romans, there's a problem. And the problem is clearly stated many places in the Old Testament. Two of them I have up here on the screen, Jeremiah 17, 9 and Ecclesiastes 9, 3. In Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Man can't discern the machinations of the human heart because it's inherently evil. That is what the Old Testament teaches because of, of sin. Does that mean man is as bad as he can be? No. But remember, what is evil in the Old Testament? Very simple. You go, we went through this. We saw it all the way through Kings. It says so and so became king and followed in the and, and followed in the footsteps of uh, Jeroboam the son of Nebat and committed evil. What was the sin? Idolatry, replacing the worship of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob with something else. That's the essence of evil. Evil is not genocide. Evil is not the Holocaust. Evil is not any of the numerous things that man wants to define evil as in terms of actions. All those things are horrible. Evil is rejecting God and substituting something else. So the heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. It is evil to the core. That means its orientation is to replace God. That's what 
Solomon states in Ecclesiastes 9.3, there's an evil in all that is done under the sun, that one thing happens to all. Truly the hearts of the sons of men are full of evil. Madness is in their hearts while they live, and after that they go to the dead. It's not a very happy picture. But see, without God, without the intrusion of grace, there, it isn't a happy picture. That's why the gospel is so important, because with the intrusion of grace, God is going to say that you can't be righteous. It's impossible. But I'm going to give you righteousness. And it's the righteousness of Christ. And that's what Romans is all about, is how God gives us righteousness and the implications of that gift of righteousness to us in terms of our spiritual life and in terms of our service to God. So we'll come back next time, pick up on a couple more of these themes, and then um, we'll go forward. Great stuff in this. What are the, the great implications for witnessing and apologizing? How do you talk to an unbeliever? If you don't understand what's going on here, you won't have a clue how to talk to an unbeliever because you're going to make false assumptions. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this opportunity to study your word this evening and to look at these things. And, and it's not easy slugging our way through some of these uh, things that may not be real familiar to understand, uh, trying to learn how to think and how people think and the implications and, and uh, consequences of bad thinking. But, Father, we know that uh, as we study your word, you will uh, help us to understand these things, and they'll become clear to us so that uh, we can use this in our own understanding of what happens in the world around us and what happens in our own soul and our own thinking when we're under the control of the sin nature so that we can uh, glorify you. And we pray that you would just challenge us because as hopeless as man looks, there is hope because you have given us that hope in Jesus Christ that there is a payment for sin and that righteousness is a gift available to all and that there is eternal salvation. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.